Um, this is one of six sessions that I am hosting over um, a three week period. Um, um, and this session is around uh, evaluating and participatory grant making. Um, we are about building kind of a movement around participatory grant making. Uh, we know that there are lots of people um, all across the world that are using this practice or looking to use this practice. Um, it isn't just kind of on the on the um, on the edges and on the fringes of stuff that we're doing. It's becoming more and more um, common practice. And I think being able to share that there's kind of a lot of us out here uh, working on this, uh, doing stuff in this space. Um, please do tweet um, if you are so inclined. Um, the hashtags that we are using is Partistry Grant Making um, and Shift the Power. Um, and if you caps lock the first word of a hashtag, so Partistry with a caps lock P and Grant Making with a caps lock G, um, one that just makes it much easier for everybody to work out what on earth the hashtag is rather than just a jumble of letters, uh, but it also helps screen readers uh, pick up what on earth we're trying to say. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. At, um, my handle is at Patterson Hannah and that's Patterson with one T. Um, and I blog about this stuff a lot on Medium if you're at all interested. So these launch events are part of the follow-up for a Winston Churchill Memorial Trust Fellowship that I was lucky enough to do um, last year, the year before, before the world shut down. Um, I got to travel um, to South Africa to meet the other foundation who are an incredible LGBT um, uh, funder in uh, Southern Africa um, and I got to travel across the US to meet about four um, party sugar makers in this space uh, and as part of that or the follow-up to that I managed to um, compile and release um, a report on everything that I found all of the kind of interesting case studies all of the interesting um, people that I met um, I have tried to make the report as easy to read as possible. I'm not one for sitting down and reading 50 pages in a row. That 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 I, that's not my not my bag. Um, so the report is written in um, in kind of sh short chapters that you can pick and choose which ones uh, work for you. You don't have to read them all. Uh, you can go for the ones that kind of best suit whatever you're trying to explore or learn about or the questions that you're grappling with. You can find the report and um, the information about the rest of the launch events um, on my website, which I will share around. Um, I'm also putting up all of the recordings for the previous events on that website. So if you missed a session and you're interested in it, please um, do have a look on the website. Um, part of the follow up from the uh, from the fellowship is that we have also developed a community of practice around party sue grant making. Uh, we started in March at the beginning of the lockdowns um, in the UK and we have amassed about 200 people that are part of that community of practice so far. Um, it involves a group of wonderful uh, people coming together in quite a nice, informal, friendly setting um, because it's all about community and making friends. Um, but it's also a uh, monthly meeting. Um, so we join together each month to chat all things party through grant making. Uh, those meetings have three different sessions that we rotate. So the session in February is a peer support session. Um, so if you've got a query or a question or something that you want to unpick or explore um, with a small group of people, um, that's a really good place to do that. Uh, we've also had a call from the community that we organised those that session um, with caucuses. So we'll be looking at a space for people of colour who are working in this um, arena um, to come together and um, have a conversation about kind of how uh, you can progress stuff, <laughs> what's pissing you off, uh, what you might want to kind of share with, with people in a similar place. So if you are interested in that, um, that's the Friday session. In March, we'll do a deep dive. So we'll be looking be exploring a specific topic so we'll be particularly looking at particip participatory budgeting um, and participatory grant making um, and how those two things overlap and um, share and differences and all things good in that space and that will be with the incredible Josh Lerner and uh, Rose Longhair so that will be an exciting session and then the session after that April um, will be an advocacy session so we'll talk about how do we share this practice further afield within philanthropy and then we rotate again so we go back to a peer support session back to a deep dive and then back to an advocacy so if you are interested in joining uh, the community of practice and want to meet some people who are also um, trying to get this stuff embedded in their organisations, please do come along. 
So as I say, this session is about evaluation. And this was a really interesting um, part of the research because there were so many different approaches to evaluating Party 2 grant making from organisations that say, well, we don't evaluate anything because actually Party 2 grant making is around communities holding each other to account. We don't get involved in that. We don't ask for for monitoring, we don't ask for reporting, um, to quite heavy monitoring reporting processes, depending on the organisation that was funding and how it was working. And actually, it was a really interesting conversation for me and, and Baljeet's on the call today. But when I started out in partisu grant making, I think I often would fall into the trap of doing things as they were done, because I was just on a hamster wheel and just did it. And Baljeet was an incredible, um, uh, critical friend who would whisper in my ear on a regular basis what are you doing and why are you doing that and are you just doing that because that's the way you always did it can't we do something different everything else has been different why are you doing it the same way um, and it was an excellent challenge um, from her and from Nusra as well who supported that work and I suppose like it really sparked my interest in actually what are other people's thoughts and opinions about how do we do evaluation in a different way where do the power dynamics sit within evaluation in monitoring um, in insights who creates knowledge where's that held um, and how do we we kind of like think about that in a participatory approach based on kind of the approaches that we're taking to funding, how does that, that fit within the life cycles? So we've got three incredible speakers joining us today. Uh, first of all, Bonnie um, from the Social Investment Consultancy. But actually, Bonnie, you've got a list as long as your arm of things that you are involved with and doing and changing the world. So you come with quite an interesting kind of particularly um, gendered um, lens to a lot of the work that you do. Um, lots of it embedded in kind of diversity, equity and inclusion, which is obviously related to so much of this work. So we're really excited to um, to hear what you're going to bring to the table. Baljeet Sandhu, who, again, it, it, it has a list as long as arm of different things that you're involved with and, um, and uh, poking and organising and improving and challenging. Um, but you've recently set up um, the knowledge, uh, the Centre for Knowledge Equity, which is a really, really exciting kind of almost like not end, but like coming together of a lot of pieces of work that you've done recently in this space to recognize like the, the knowledge comes from all sorts of places and we should recognize that rather than just um, putting academic knowledge or learnt experience um, and knowledge on a kind of pedestal. So that stuff's really exciting. Um, and then Melanie, who I was really lucky enough to meet when I was traveling um, part of the Disability Rights Fund, who are an incredible part of Street Grant Maker. Um, and actually you blew my mind. The conversations that I had with you about evaluation, I was like, this is where it's at. This is really exciting. So I um, can't wait to kind of share your views and thoughts and um, insights for the rest of this lovely bunch on the call. So um, I think what we are going to do now, if I can stop showing my screen so that you're not um, bamboozled with all of that. Um, we're going to kick off, Bonnie, you're going to give us a very brief kind of overview of the kind of more wider context in this space. So over to you. Great. Well, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep this relatively short. Uh, it's really just big picture framing. Um, I don't know how many of you are actually evaluators, but uh, if you are, it would be great just to have you type in the chat uh, your relationship to evaluation or what brings you here today. Um, I think out of uh, the three speakers, all of us have a lot to do with evaluation. And my point of view uh, to this conversation is really as a third party evaluator, very often to foundations, to uh, programs. And I will just tell all of you a little bit about how I got into evaluation because I think it speaks to what evaluation has been for uh, in the funding and wider in the social change sector. So I came into evaluation originally because I was just very, very obsessed with this question, what really works in social change? And evaluation as a role um, helps you understand that. Um, and so I got into this consultancy role uh, where we started evaluating uh, a lot of social change programs, uh, supporting funders on understanding effectiveness of what they have funded. But I think gradually I've come to see that evaluation has been used as a um, measure of control and sometimes coercion as well uh, by funders wanting to understand 
um, and needing to prove how funding has been effective. Um, and what I've noticed uh, is evaluation, yes. most people are less, or we spend less time on actually the learning part of the evaluation. So evaluation is often tied with a lot of acronyms like monitoring evaluation, M and E, and gradually that then changed to MEL, monitoring evaluation and learning. Um, and of course, evaluation, um, uh, last year, was it last year where uh, we had the um, Nobel Prize for economics uh, uh, won by a few academics who have pioneered or done a lot of work in uh, randomized controlled trials. So you have a school of thought within evaluation that is much, very, very rigorous, very scientific, but you also have evaluators that are bringing much more um, kind of liberal critical theories uh, to evaluation. So I think all of that we need to hold in tension and we need to see uh, evaluation really as a spectrum where a lot of different school of thoughts are coming together and also to then reflect on why do people commission evaluation in the first place? And if that has come from a position of coercion and control, or has it come more from learning? And I think situating this conversation today, evaluating participatory grant making, um, I think you still see evaluations in two camps. You still have funders, uh, practitioners that might be on the edge of whether they want to do participatory grant making, needing to evaluate something to prove something that they already might have uh, in their own bias or in their own minds. But you really also have one of the most exciting evaluations coming out that are rooted more in this idea of learning. What can we really learn about what works to include, truly include people in conversations and in decision making? So I think with that uh, kind of framing in mind, I'll pass to uh, my fellow namesake. Uh, <laughs> uh, we uh, we've, uh, share the same surname, Melanie, across uh, in, in Boston. If you just want to share a bit uh, kind of from your perspective, and then we'll get into our individual presentations. Over to you, Melanie. Thanks, Bonnie, um, for that great overview. And yes, my husband is always happy to meet another two and to hear about other two that are out there in the world. Um, so I just, before I start, I just wanted to say thank you again to you all for joining us and to Hannah for this conversation. I'm actually in Los Angeles, California today on the traditional and unceded lands of the Tonga and Kichwa Gabriel Band of um, Mission Indians. And actually today is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So it's a wonderful day in the States, at least to be commemorating um, his legacy and thinking through shifting power. Um, and thinking about evaluation, I fully agree with the points that Bonnie was making. I think before I talk about what we mean by evaluation specifically on this phone call, I'll just have two quick comments. If you're answering the question of if something happened or not in evaluation, that has a lot to do with the power dynamics, you know, did, did something happen? Um, but I think if you're answering more of the question of how it happened, you're getting more at learning. Um, and so I will um, be using some technical terms in the evaluatory field. And so feel free to um, chat for particular definitions if it's, it's needed any further. Um, but at Disability Rights Fund and Disability Rights Advocacy Fund or DRF or DRAF and uh, across a number of just excellent organizations that I've um, seen and learned with over the years, um, evaluation is really a comprehensive integration. And so evaluation, um, I've even seen some organizations use the full acronym DMEAL, so design, monitoring, evaluation, accountability, thinking about accountability to your um, community stakeholders as opposed to your donors and learning. Um, and I have an image here up on this slide that looks like that is a Venn diagram of four different circles overlapping each other thinking about how design and your data collection and how you analyze your data is supposed to be shaping your practice. And all of those things feed into each other and ideally you have systems in place. Um, and so at DRF and DRAF, we actually have uh, an ME manual. It's, it's our longest manual, it's 140 pages. Um, and that sounds like a lot, but actually 80% of that manual are grant making templates. So from templates for um, providing annual country context updates, 
the grant recommendation memos themselves um, for the different types of grants that we provide, as well as uh, the different grantee reporting templates and the tools that we use to collect from grantees uh, perceptions of how they think things are going. That's all in our m and &E manual. And um, that's because we see different data points coming in and feeding into how we're doing. Um, I would say um, as a sort of, well, I'll talk a little bit more about this later in my presentation, but how the field of evolution really is at its starting point of how do you evaluate participation and how do you evaluate participatory grant making. Um, so this then means that there are um, tools, again, that we're collecting uh, that we have learning from grantees. We have internal monitoring and stakeholder insights um, tools as well to gather information from board members, from our grant making committee, who are persons with disabilities. And then I would say a rather critical piece that's not often included in whether or not an organization is learning and evaluating and having evaluative thinking is the organizational incentives and accountability mechanisms that you have. So we're all driven by incentives, you know, whether or not we sort of realize it are always conscious of that. Um, and so a really effective learning organization, a reflective um, organization is going to be thinking about how are we implementing those things that we're learning, effectively um, looping back to our processes and procedures. So over time, um, I would say these are relatively recent developments that we've thought about how do we incentivize organizational learning. So there are questions around learning um, in our annual staff performance reviews. And it can be as simple as a question of asking someone how are they integrating what they've learned in the past year into what they're redoing into their new work plan in the subsequent year. Um, and everybody should ideally be contributing to learning, right? If you're changing the whole system, if you're moving toward a particular goal together, everyone, whether you're doing finance, um, getting out uh, grant recommendation memos as the program officers and working with the grantees at those uh, particular touch points, or if you're um, doing more administrative things, you all wanna be moving toward the same goals and asking each other those questions really helps that. Um, and the last thing I'll say around sort of organizational incentives is that might include, as we talk about formal external evaluations and the recommendations that come out of those, you can have uptake tracking processes that see, are you holding yourself um, to responding to what uh, your stakeholders have reported anonymously in an external evaluation? And are you holding yourself to the commitment that you have made perhaps in a management response or acknowledging that the recommendations that came forward are um, honest ones that need to be examined well and um, time needs to be invested in looking into those. So I'll stop there. On me, excellent. Thanks Melanie, that was um, an excellent oversight. Um, I think we are now um, going to hand over to um, to Bonnie to give us a bit more kind of information on the stuff that you are focusing on. Great, thank you again. Um, so um, I, I'm going to make yeah, just uh, perhaps share with you all my perspectives into this, um, and handing then back again to Melanie on the. I think her case study on how they do it at Disability Rights Fund, uh, because I think a lot of what I say will then uh, be brought to light um, before we hear from Valjeet. Um, but I maybe just to take a step back, my work portfolio currently uh, at, at the consultancy, I have uh, quite a big chunk of work around diversity, equity and inclusion, and then uh, quite a bit on impact evaluation. And I've often questioned why they are not merging more together. So it feels like clients, mainly foundations, ask me to help them review their DEI or EDI or whatever, JADI, uh, whatever those acronyms now, now are. Um, uh, from a strategic point of view. So looking at grant making, uh, looking at workforce uh, diversity, looking at board diversity, but often evaluation is not part of that. And I don't, I don't know why, and I, I'm still trying to get to the bottom of that. And then I would have uh, 
clients asking me to help them evaluate their, their programs or their portfolios. And very rarely would clients commissioning those evaluation be really attentive to the power dynamics. And I often ask myself, why do we not kind of merge them together? Why don't we, you know, on one hand, when we look at DEI strategies for foundations, look at evaluation as part of that? And on the other hand, why don't we take an EDI lens to evaluation? Um, I think part of that is the people who are working in those spaces don't often kind of see the the respective fields. So evaluators can often either be conditioned to think, oh, we need to be very objective. So we can't introduce things like power dynamics or justice into the way we do evaluation. Or on the other hand, uh, with DEI, it could often be driven by people working in grant making who have been perhaps outsourcing evaluation for a long time to external contractors, so may not think of the importance of that. But what I'm trying to say is evaluation is so, so important uh, in the DEI conversation, and we really urgently need a more inclusive approach to doing evaluation. Um, and there are so many reasons why, and there will be other platforms for that, whether it is changing, um, whether it's challenging how evaluation has been quite exploitative uh, to date uh, in how evaluation is conducted. And, you know, Melanie, I think, will share much more um, in her own perspectives, uh, and so will Baoji. So I won't go into that. But I think back to the topic today, you know, evaluating participatory grant making is so important that the participatory ethos of participatory grant making are not then lost when you come to evaluation. We shouldn't just refer back to traditional ways of evaluating when we're evaluating participatory grant making. It's really, really important that that filters through. Uh, but in terms of what we evaluate, just to touch up on that, uh, the Ford Foundation, you know, has this really great guide and Hannah can comment how great it is or not. I, I don't know from a participatory grant making perspective, but in that report, um, which many of you might have come across, they do have an annex and note it is again an annex because often it's uh, an afterthought um, when it comes to evaluation. Um, but they do they have highlighted six different outcomes, which I'll paste in the chat as well, uh, what you should look for when you evaluate participatory grant making. So I see quite a few of you here are evaluators. So if you have uh, are evaluating a participatory grant making program, uh, these are the things that you can look for in your theory of change in your evaluation framework. Um, Bonnie, yeah. I'm just going to read those out just in case anybody is not yes, on the oh, chat. Yeah, um, participation. Oh, yeah, should, on, should I read on. it? Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, so it's participation level, um, quality of the engagement experience, actions taken as a result of participatory grant making, participant outcomes, community outcomes, and field outcomes. I'll paste the link as well later on after I finish speaking. So you can also look uh, into that guide and find the annex yourself because they explain it in more detail. So that's the what. In terms of how, I've mentioned that it's really important that the participatory and inclusive ethos come through uh, in the evaluation of participatory grant making. So there's certain methodologies that are very well suited, whether it's participatory evaluation. Um, we have written a guide uh, at, um, at the consultancy around inclusive uh, monitoring and evaluation. Uh, so we have a methodology that we can share. There's a lot in feminist evaluation. It's more of principles-based evaluation, uh, but a lot of cross-learnings that can be applied. There's systems change evaluation. There's equitable evaluation. I mean, there's so many methodologies that if you're interested, I'm happy to have uh, more chats about this. Um, but, you know, it's important to recognize that they do need resourcing, uh, especially, you know, the resourcing that you consider when you, it comes to participants in the participatory grant making process, that same consideration of resourcing needs to come through for resourcing evaluation as well. And there are some tools that I found really helpful uh, as an evaluator. I'm a big fan of participatory photography or photo voice. I, I'm a big fan that I actually started a charity doing that, uh, focus on women's empowerment. Uh, it's called Lensational. Um, you can, yeah, Hannah paste on my Twitter so you can uh, look at my Twitter and there's a link to that organization. Uh, so participatory photography, especially if you're working in um, with communities that have um, 
that have not been formally educated or have different ways of wanting to express themselves, multimedia tools are really, really helpful. There's a tool as well called Power Cube. Um, so it's a visual representation of power. It dissects power in four ways, power over, which is a traditional way of looking at power, power to, power with, and power within. So these are just the visual ways of actually analyzing power and a tool that you can get participants to. Um, kind of charge out how power actually looks like and how whether it's evolved over time if we're really talking about shifting the power and then principles so um, having the funding program the participatory grant making program comes up with a list of principles ideally co-created and then have um, your participants rate those principles over time to see how we're doing so these are just some you know I, I talked about the what you know what you evaluate how the methodologies and just some tools to to, to tease this out. So hopefully it will be helpful to bring some inspiration to uh, all of you if you're looking to evaluate participatory making initiatives. But over to Melanie, who I think has uh, one of the best case studies ever in, in terms of evaluating participatory grant making. So over to you. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, I don't know about best <laughs> case studies ever. I think that's a bit um, it's a high bar, but I will say that, um, you know, we have been working on this for some time. Hannah has mentioned the Ford Foundation um, and their investment in participatory grant making as well includes um, providing grants to nine different uh, research sort of uh, teams in, and DRF is one of those. And uh, we are actually looking specifically at our model and how it contributes to the different advocacy successes we've seen with persons with disabilities. So I've uh, traditionally actually came from evaluation through peace building. Um, and that field is uh, particularly challenging to tease through outcomes and achievements. And so moving over to DRF, and looking at the many achievements that have been made by grantees over the more than decade or so has been fantastic to see so much change. So in the last 11 years, I will give you sort of one data point around our um, different achievements, but there have been more than 150 national and local legislative legislation that's been passed, uh, policies that have been changed, or uh, government programs that have been in line with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And so um, that's really significant change. And so we're curious how much does uh, the change that's been able to be achieved have to do with the participation of persons with disabilities? So I'm gonna go over some of the principles that we use to ground our work, which I think is really critical um, in, in guiding us and making sure that we are um, sort of staying on focus and on point. I'll also talk a little bit about um, how we have integrated participation and participatory um, processes in our evaluation. Um, and I had alluded to earlier that actually measuring participatory grant making and evaluating different pieces of that, as Bonnie was alluding to, whether that has to do with um, how involved different people feel, different stakeholders feel, um, whether or not the decisions um, specifically on the funding and whether where the funding is going is making a difference or if there's a lot more expansive um, pieces to that. Um, and we're finding in our research that there are more um, benefits than just the advocacy achievements that have been seen over the years. So stay tuned for that report um, and that just sort of little teaser. So on the first slide that we had was um, just some principles that were there around learning and evaluation. And I'll um, let Hannah go back to that slide. But really it's about grounding our work in human rights um, principles and making sure that um, we are thinking about this from a rights-based perspective. Um, as you may know, if you work in advocacy or any other sort of complex context, uh, long term change is critical. And, and part of that when you're working with marginalized groups is thinking about capacity growth and development. And for us, that's specifically of, of the disability movement and persons with disabilities. Um, there is a recognition that needs to happen in uh, evaluatory work that there is a broad scope of what it means to um, be a person with disability 
what it means to be a family member, perhaps, of a person with a disability. And ultimately, as we talk about learning and not just evaluation, there needs to be mutual uh, benefit, both to the organization that is commissioning the work and the disability movement itself. And so next slide, Hannah. And so part of that for us means that there are a couple of ongoing considerations that we think through on a, on a regular basis. And one of that is how should the methods and frameworks change when our particular target community um, includes persons who have been marginalized through their disability status, perhaps through their gender expression and their sexual orientation, uh, through uh, economics and where they are in their social um, economic status. And so these are questions that we've grappled with. I'll just say really quickly that for us, um, that means that the more flexible the methodology can be, the better it is, um, because we have to be able to adapt for different persons' accessibility needs, for different education levels, and for different perspectives on life. Um, and a lot of um, the perspectives piece, as Bonnie was alluding to, has come from some of the feminist evaluation literature that's out there. The second question that we really think about is how can our authentic participation, meaning decision-making authority, whether that has to do specifically with where the funds go um, for a particular grant, or even the strategies and objectives that a particular community will take over the next several years and what we should be funding, um, how does that contribute to these advocacy achievements uh, that self-advocates are looking at? So next slide, please. So one of the ways that we have uh, integrated participation into our evaluation is in our pathway to change. And our pathway to change is what we call our theory to cha of change. Um, and we've been told to call it a pathway of change because it's been so effective over the last decade, it's no longer a theory. Right? So we know that when we provide, it's, this slide has a image of sort of a stepwise sequence of progress, although life is never that linear, but it's nice to see in an image. Um, that we know that when we provide grants to persons with disabilities, when technical assistance is provided, on how to achieve um, advocacy and what it looks like to build up grassroots movements. And when there is advocacy at the global level, so there's an interaction between what's happening at the global level with what's happening at the regional and national and local level, that um, when those initial investments are made, uh, movements are built, persons with disabilities can drive the agenda and ultimately they achieve a, a greater depth of their rights. And this pathway to change I share with you because persons with disabilities at the very start of DRF and DRAF uh, put this pathway to change together. Next slide, please. Um, so we have integrated over time, not just uh, an examination of the direct link between persons with disabilities making decisions on where funding is going to advocacy achievements, but think that it's critical to look through participatory processes and to make that even further um, integrated throughout the organization. And so there has been participation and decision-making in evaluation by persons with disabilities. Bonnie was talking about the different types of evaluation that can be um, uh, uh, commissioned. Um, and so, uh, one of the ways that we have done that is by formalizing is um, grantee perceptions in an annual grantee survey. Um, we've just developed an indicator in our organizational log frame um, that really looks solely at whether or not persons with disabilities who are particularly marginalized, right? So I think if in sort of any social movement, you have um, sort of even there, there are hierarchies. And, and different dynamics of power. And so we look in particular at, at persons who are even marginalized within the disability movement. That can be women with disabilities, indigenous persons with disabilities, uh, persons of um, varying diverse socioesque um, identities or persons who it depends on sort of a regional space. So maybe in Africa, you may be a person with albinism and that particularly marginalized marginalizes you within the disability community. So we're looking at whether or not those particular marginalized groups um, feel that they are more involved, not just in society, but actually within their own movement. Um, and we have persons with disabilities making uh, decisions 
on, again, where the advocacy agenda should be for the next few years within that country. Um, I would say the most recent effort we have made in participatory processes is to look at um, having persons with disabilities or grantees themselves actually design our, the evaluation that was being um, commissioned for that particular region. All right, and next slide. Um, and then we also look at our staff. So much of our staff are persons with disabilities themselves that come from the movement. Um, they often have been working for organizations of persons with disabilities, self-advocates over the years. And so it's important to get their perspective as well on how we are learning. So I have on this slide a, a screenshot of something that we call a learning journal. It's a form of action research. Um, action research um, in its more expansive form may dictate that you take a diary every day and look back at what you're learning. Uh, that just seemed too much to ask both of our grantees and of our program staff. Um, so we do these learning journals twice a year. Um, and it allows us just to collect um, their reflections, the staff reflections on what's happening. Um, they are often filtering through what they're hearing from grantees. It's a very simple question. I'm happy to share this with anyone. We ask five questions of every grantee sort of twice a year to help us on this reflective process. And then once that's done, I have individual reflection discussions with each program officer to talk through what they've been observing. Um, and then we have a collective reflection discussion, what we call collective reflection um, once a year with all of our program staff and our entire team. Um, next slide, please. And this is my last slide about how we've integrated participatory processes. On this slide, you'll see um, an image here of an easy to read version of the findings of our most recent evaluations. And so it's really critical um, to resource feedback loops. Um, I will share really briefly, I um, recall hearing from an evaluation colleague um, that had dogs set upon them because their organization unfortunately wasn't so great at providing feedback loops. Um, evaluators would often come and ask them numerous questions but never give the community back um, any information about what was found and how the community was being impacted. Um, and so I don't think that's, we're near that point yet, but it's a critical point to think about a very vivid image about how persons with disabilities or really any target community needs to know what you're doing with their data. Um, and that builds that sense of trust and that sense of community that's critical for participatory grant making and to really understand what people um, are experiencing and, and knowing and so they'll be honest with you. So we have uh, grantee learning versions of our external evaluations. And so what we've done is we've basically translated the findings that were really written toward us as an audience and pulled that out to see what could be potentially relevant for our grantees and how they could use that information, whether it was in their own advocacy projects, future funding proposals for us or a different funder, um, or even just to talk within the community and, and the movement themselves at the national level about what else needs to change. Um, and so then we also resource, as I had mentioned, this easy to read version of the learning documents so that people who have different learning styles, who have a different neurodiversity can also benefit from the information that we have as well. And so I'll stop there and happy to take questions later. Brilliant, thank you, um, Melanie, that was amazing. And I think um, what really struck me when I was visiting you was the kind of the feedback loop in, in, in the processes and actually the learning journals being able to identify like whether there were gaps in capacity building or gaps in kind of your strategy so uh, that you can kind of adapt and change. And I think one of the things I really took home from our conversation all those months ago was like, if, the, if, if nothing is changing because of your evaluation, then what is the point in doing it? Stop wasting people's time, which I think is a definite paraphrase because I think you would have said it in a much more polite way. But, um, but that was kind of like a really interesting 
interesting take home for me and kind of really give me a bit of a kick that, that I needed to, to, to take away. Um, Baldi, we're going to pass over to you now. Um, and I know that you're, you're kind of, um, you're the learning partner for the Party Street Lab Making programme that um, I run at the National Lottery Community Fund. And I think one of the things that kind of has really struck me through that relationship and that work is actually as funders, we often choose the easiest things to measure um, because they are easy. Um, and then what that does is that then skews the work that's being done. So if we're asking people how many people are coming to your community group, you know, how many people said they'd recommend this service to another person, that's great. But then that organization spends all their time trying to get people through the door uh, rather than actually focusing on the stuff that we never measure because we find it really difficult, like love and passion and life-saving stuff that, that just kind of falls through the gaps. So I wonder if there's stuff that you've kind of like like learn and picked up through the processes that you might want to share and also being just a general critical friend of mine and being like do it better oh well thank you so much hannah and for creating this space and all the work you're doing and creating such a wonderful community and just to hear from bonnie and melanie who i fangirl with the incredible work that they do and just writing down learning and we're constantly on a learning journey um and no and what i'll um, and first of all a huge thank you and i think i'm going to touch on some of the, you know the, the I mean, the participatory grant making model of the Leaders with Lived Experience Fund that we're now in the second year outside of the pilot. So I'll share some, some reflections and thoughts and observations from that. Um, but also there's been a couple of um, uh, participatory grant making programs that we've supported during, in, in response to COVID, which have been co-designed by and for marginalized communities across the UK. So I might just, throwing some thoughts around our roles uh, um, as, as, as people who may be evaluating or learning um, and part of that work, whether we're funders or whether we're actually um, researchers and evaluators. And there's a lot of things that we can do better just as humans. And so I'll take you back to the feeling and the thinking around how we can do that. But first of all, I just want to say to you that, um, I'll just begin by saying, because so much learning has come out from our incredible program, Hannah, and you and Connor will, know that and we've been at speed especially because we entered year two of the pilot fund as as the pandemic hit and there was just really fast learning and capturing that learning um so um what i just wanted to say is that um evaluating and learning the joys of evaluating participatory grant, make, uh, grant making is just is just a powerful way of learning about the leadership and wisdom of the communities we purport to serve and if it's done well it should surprise you and frustrate you as well as enthuse you because if you're just simply enthused and uplifted um, I would question whether you've created the mechanisms for deep learning beyond your own personal gratification or organizational understanding of yet another model um, because I think what I've also seen is people just like um, funders especially and, and certain um, folk wanting to do this because it's the right thing to do then patting themselves on the back because they're elated that they're finally sitting around the decision making table with communities they fund and that can be a really natural high so it's um, it's just really starting to understand that we really need to be challenged this is about power right um, and uh, participatory grant making and and Hannah beautifully encapsulates in her report um, and all, all of the discussions is that we're trying, this is a way of actually starting to shift long-standing power relationships um, in all of our kind of social good ecosystem, especially um, our learning uh, approaches to learning and evaluation that, and Bonnie has touched on the historical kind of history of, 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 of thinking about different ways that we actually evaluate and, and monitor our work. Um, but it's also about organizational cultures. Um, and also if learning is done well, it actually can help from participatory grant making can revisit your broader strategies for change uh, in your area of focus. Um, and that's what I can just, you know, that you can see that coming out from the work that Melanie and their, their organization have been doing. It's constantly feeding into, um, um, into the work that they're doing. Um, so I would just say that um, Hannah and her team were very intentional about their approach to evaluation, um, um, as well as the design of the fund, which was co-designed by and for leaders with lived experience after lots of convenings around the UK, um, across various cities as well, with many leaders with direct first-hand experience of social um, injustice or marginalisation. Um, 
um, from very, very diverse communities. But then also what they were very intentional about doing was also once grantees had been selected after the fund uh, was designed, was to have them actually select uh, the learning partner as well. Um, and that has been a really important um, approach, I think. It was so valued um, by the grantee partners who had then also now become part, uh, participants in the decision making. So a really uh, excellent way of actually building community. And I think we shouldn't, that shouldn't be underestimated. Um, and also the, uh, you know, knowing why you are designing a participatory grant making, making model from the outset. I think, um, you know, uh, uh, Bonnie and Melanie have touched on, you know, we all have incentives the fund as funders, um, you know, um, but why are you doing it? Is it is it because you're feeling it's the right thing to do? Or is it just about, oh, right now at this moment, we need more representation of marginalized communities? Well, be careful because that could lead you down the TikTok path. Um, and I think, that you know we were really uh, intentionally vague with our evaluation learning partner approach for the leaders with lived experience fund and it was around well first of all let's recognize that what you know we all need to understand what lived experience leadership means and the fund was supporting lived experience leaders and their leadership and um and supporting them in different ways of doing that so actually it was that to be for them to to also um help us um understand that um but also understanding what success success meant um and so for what i would say with some of the other funds that we've been involved in design and also thinking about the evaluation i think you know um it's really important to just be transparent as a funder and or, or someone designing the participatory grant making model about your parameters and the realities of your boundaries as a funder whether it's um whether it's going to be a part of an existing program of work or something that you're going to be doing new and need buy-in from your trustees um, because they will have their own views because we've seen a, an incredible funder who's just being given to communities they can make decisions and then afterwards not necessarily being happy with the decisions that have been made by the communities and the participants um, because of the restrictions and the parameters um, um, of, of, say, trustees or the board. So just be clear at, at, at the beginning. And that just, again, builds trust with the participant community as well. Because we, let, if we get real, this is about um, also understanding that there is a lot of mistrust around because of power dynamics and, and how we have done our work, even in the social uh, good ecosystem, and how do we start to nurture and build that trust and transparency and just being clear, you know, the, and, and often there can be this assumption that there's going to be this kind of pushback and anger from marginalized communities just be real and be transparent about what, what parameters you're working with. Um, and I think that also um, one of the things, and I think, um, you know, Melanie's beautifully touched on this and something that's been really thought, uh, thought through with the team um, um, at, at uh, the National Lottery Community Fund as well is, you know, we have to think, think about the power within that sits within just evaluation and who are we recruiting to carry out the work as I've just touched on, but how are we actually um, elevating dominant forms of knowledge in that process in terms of technical expertise, um, whether it's in, within the people we recruit, whether it's in our le own learning teams within funders, but also the intermediary commission. Um, because what we found with really well-intentioned intermediaries, and, and that's why the work of Bonnie has been in a way revolutionary for us in the UK, is because a lot of really well-intentioned evaluators in the UK have a, a very service user model approach um, to, uh, to examining engagement and participation or a user experience approach to, to thinking about learning. And actually what we need to start to do is understanding the different, you know, who we value as knowledge producers and the value of lived expertise as well as learned and practice expertise. And I think what I would really, uh, and this is something to honor, uh, and I have to honor the movement that we're part of, uh, which is called the Lived Experience Leaders Movement. I think we now, we can do better. We need to understand that communities and marginalized communities are more than their vulnerable identities. We have many, many lived experience leaders who have direct first and experience who are integrating their lived, learned and practice expertise. People who are 
researchers who are wanting to be part of, part of evaluation teams, who want to collaborate in learning um, collaborations and inquiries, and yet don't have any access to this field and this discipline, and we should do better. And we, in our uh, lived experience leaders movement, have so many incredible leaders who want to actually also activate their learned expertise with their lived. And I think we need to start to also open up um, and think about who, we're, who we consider as evaluators. And then I would just say that, you know, and um, again, the need for flexibility and fluidity um, in understanding the learning that is happening and the wisdom and the insights that come through. Um, it, we have to be comfortable with uncertainty um, we, what we don't know, we don't know. And so, so what we, we did with the Leaders with Lived Experience um, pilot programme was to actually just really step into to that uncertainty, have a more of an emergent approach and an emergent strategy to the way that we were going to, to learn and also um, support then uh, the participatory element of the second fund that was launched in, in October um, uh, in 2020. And that was really to start to really understand that there's a spectrum of leadership and wisdom within, within marginalised communities and various ways that they express and articulate that wisdom and how they're deploying it um, and how we have to capture that learning to share it um, as part of the work. And, and with that, it can really challenge assumptions. And I'll just give you one example. I mean, during the pandemic, um, you know, it was a natural assumption, even for the National Lottery Community Fund team, um, that many of the grantee partners of of the Leaders with Lived Experience Pilot Fund had, like many of the mainstream charities, had to shut up shop um, and couldn't actually carry on with their projects and programmes. Well, actually, we found as the learning part that it was absolutely the reverse. They were pivoting at pace, um, um, not only with their project that they had been funded for in terms of their leadership, but also in their services. They were deploying because they were largely from communities and leaders from communities. They were deploying real time solutions to address uh, to address needs during the pandemic. And so for us as a learning partner, we could have we could have stuck with our brief, our deliverables, but we, we had a responsibility as the learning partner to share that back um, with, with also um, Hannah and her team and the National Lottery Community Fund, because the sophisticated nature of learning that we were capturing in terms of how, how leaders and lived experience leaders were enhancing their policy and influencing work, how they were actually starting to develop and share knowledge um, and activating and deploying sophisticated networks was crucial. Um, um, and so we did an interim urgent report for the team and and it, but for that learning we would not have launched the incredible fund that was launched it for lived experience leaders um during covid to actually expand um the fund and the program um and where we had um, uh, grantee partners who were part of the decision making and it's an incredible cohort of 49 new organisations who are going to be funded but it was a real understanding of the sophisticated levels of strategy building time for strategic thinking that communities needed beyond the service user engagement and marginal and emerging leaders actually elders who needed support elders who needed to actually um, needed space to design and innovate and and also the need to actually build intersectional networks um, across the movement of lived experience leaders. And that actually fed in straight to the eligibility of this, this second fund. And um, so I wanted to really share that as that's the power really of, of how evaluations can work. And I think for us, I would just end with saying, we need to interrupt our evaluation habits and cultures. M much of it that doesn't serve us well or gets in our way. Um, and many of that is because of our historical and structural issues and hang ups that Bonnie has touched on, um, uh, which has created the conditions uh, um, that of how we produce learning, how we consume it, how we manage it, and how we how we how we actually own that learning as well. And I think I would just end by saying there's so much more to share from from the work that we've been doing. But I would just say one of that uh, one of those things that I want to touch on is 
really, really start to be, even when we're well-intentioned, we all want to actually do better and share learning. And, and that, you know, as Bonnie said, it's crucial that we understand impact from what is happening on the ground so we can, we can deploy efforts in the right places. But please know that even when you're well-intentioned in your approach, there are unconscious biases that will come through. We have actually seen a lot of really well-intentioned funders and evaluators adopt narratives that continue to marginalize communities and leaders within communities who are participating in these programs um, and uh, especially focusing on their vulnerability often seeing communities as, as very vulnerable focusing on inc the inclusive nature of uh, participatory grant making rather than a, a kind of a fear of the of elders and community leadership so I think there needs to be a real shift in the paradigm of what we understand as the leaders and the spectrums of leaders um, who participate in our models and also the privilege of dismissal that we can hold and I think that we have to honour um, and acknowledge the contributors of knowledge when we as, as evaluators and learning partners I have seen many evaluators now sit and take down notes profusely learning from the wisdom of the communities who are participating in these models and often it's an inadvertent extraction because it's an aha moment we're taking that that, that knowledge you can see is is being taken down written down but then reinterpreted in a different language without any credit attribution to the communities who are providing that wisdom and that is one small thing we can all do is credit value everyone who is giving us wisdom because that's how we can avoid erasure of knowledge producers and we all can come together to to unite our knowledge and and i know we we, we're, um, we haven't got much time so i wanted to just share that um with you all and and and, and also honor the incredible work of hannah and, and connor and their team in in what we've been doing been able to achieve over the last um several months thanks Bertie. Um, and I think there's probably takeaways for us all there, particularly funders, even if you're not using participatory approaches um, and being really, really deliberate in like actually who pays for this stuff. Um, and actually, there's always a cost to evaluation and learning. It's not free time that people sit on to be able to answer your questions and stuff if you're not building in the uh, the resources and the money to pay people to engage in monitoring and evaluation and reporting um that's a struggle for people to engage in so we are just about at time and um, that's absolutely flown by um as you as i mentioned at the beginning um there is the hashtag so if you want to carry on the conversation um or ask any of our speakers questions then we can follow up there and um, this is a topic that keeps coming back and um, so it's likely that we'll be exploring it in different places in different spaces um throughout kind of the rest of our conversations around parties you got making so um do keep in touch with the community of practice and um, we have three sessions um left um, in this series. So on Wednesday, um, we've got systematic change through parties to grant making uh, with um, the other foundation from South Africa. Um, that will be amazing. Um, the US lot, that might be slightly out of your time zone, but if you do want to register the, for the event, we'll be sending out the recordings afterwards. Um, on the 27th of January, uh, my I'm really excited about this session. We've got a future gazing session. So we'll be having um, five minute presentations from people um, reimagining what for philanthropy and parties who are making could be in the future will we live on the moon uh, will the uk be underwater uh, what's the response to philanthropy as um, as the world begins to change um, and on the 28th of january we've got the final session around operationalizing which i don't i don't know if i've made this up whether i can say it um, but how do you actually get this stuff done what staff do you need what resources uh, what does that look like um, thank you so much for coming along it's so nice to see you um, Happy end of the day from everybody in the UK because it's now home time, although we never really leave our homes um, and happy um, Martin Luther King Day to all those in the US. Thank you for joining in. If you are meant to be on holiday, I really appreciate it. And for everybody else anywhere else in the world, I hope you are safe and happy and have a lovely evening. Enjoy some trash TV. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Anna. Thank you very much. Bye.